analogy, which I like very much, which was to think about time um, in terms of centuries by thinking about our own clock. So if we start from the time scale that I'm talking about, is if we think of every hour as being 100 years, one century, we're going to start from 5 o'clock yesterday. And we're going to come till 8.09 tonight, which will be an hour from now, roughly. And this will be the history of the consciousness of the self that I'm going to go through with you. With you. And so every one hour corresponds to 100 years. So we're going to start from 5 o'clock yesterday and work our way till the present time. If you think about it, in the ancient times, um, people were really, their ideas were really were ruled by mythology. So they tried to explain the events around themselves through some kind of supernatural phenomena. So if there was a drought, they thought the gods were angry with them. Um, if there was a good harvest, they thought they'd done something that the gods were happy with. And this sort of mythical state, this mythological state of mind continued until uh, in Greece, in classical Greece, where certain people started to think that, well, we should try to explain the world around us through reason rather than just this sort of superstition in a sense. And so the roots of classical philosophy, which really was the science of that time, it was a transition, a very important transition, were developed at the time. And what we find is that from the time of, of ancient Greece throughout the different centuries and millennia until today, different people from all over the world have been interested in this subject of the mind and consciousness. And in more recent times, they've been joined by psychologists, such as Chris French here, and then very recently by scientists as well, and that I'm talking about the last 30 or maybe 40 years maximum. But what we see is that if we go back to 700 years before, roughly 700 years before Christ, from the time of Homer, so 5 o'clock yesterday afternoon, and we start from there, that at that time, in ancient Greece, there was an idea developing about the, the mind or consciousness or the soul. Um, and they also called the soul the psyche. So what they were interested in was, what is it that makes us into who we are? What gives us life and gives us our unique characteristics that we have? And their concepts had really developed into a specific meaning. But what's very interesting, which I was fascinated to find out, was that although if you mention to anyone today what's the soul, they automatically think of something religious, something that maybe survives after death uh, or concepts like that. But interestingly, if you go back to Greek concepts of the psyche, although it was very widespread, um, the beliefs about it were also very diverse. So some people believed that it was immaterial, that it did survive after death, and some people believed that actually, no, it's a bodily function it, and it doesn't survive uh, death at all. And those, that kind of dualistic view has really continued from that time until the, t the present time. So I've just highlighted a couple of interesting um, uh, philosophers' views. You may know um, that the first notion of atom theory is attributed to Democritus, who lived around 460 or was born 460 before Christ. And he thought to himself that everything that exists has to be reduced down to some fundamental basic element, atoms, from which everything else is constructed. So it took us thousands of years to be able to come to that scientifically, but he was the first person that is thought to have thought about that idea. And so what he believed, and people who followed his belief system, was that we also have soul atoms. So the soul itself, the mind or consciousness, is also made up of little atoms. And so when you die, like the rest of the body, those soul atoms also disperse, and there's nothing left of us. Pythagoras, on the other hand, who's famous for his theorem, um, believed that actually the soul or consciousness is very much something that comes from the divine. And we'll see that this is something that continues throughout time. There are people who believe that this consciousness is so unique that it has to have a different origin. So he believed that it had a divine origin and that it continues to exist after death. And by the time of Socrates, certainly we know that the self or the soul had become a distinguishing mark for all living beings. And they didn't really believe that only humans had a, a soul or the self, that also all living beings had some concept of this, this self or consciousness. And it really was the subject of the emotional states responsible for mental and psychological functioning, thoughts, perceptions, desires, and the planning, uh, planning and bearer of all moral and virtue in human beings. So again, you can see it's what we are interested in today. What is it that makes us unique as individuals? And all those years ago, they were thinking about it. Now, two eminent philosophers, obviously, are Plato and Aristotle. Some people... Um, have followed essentially one or either of the, the viewpoints expressed by these two. And therefore, I wanted to just spend a little bit of time to talk about 
uh, Plato's view and also Aristotle's view. Now, Plato um, had a very interesting I, thought, and I don't know how he came to this opinion, but he believed that everything that we see in the material world is an imperfect example of a perfect existence in, say, the world of a soul, something immaterial. And he believed that the human soul or psyche has a divine origin, it's always been there and will continue after death. But that it is essentially that soul or psyche that forms the physical organs, the physical organism, somehow. A bit like how you may have a blueprint or an archetype for a construction. He believed that the soul is that blueprint and it's that that forms, puts the bricks together and you, you can form a building. It's that soul that puts the body together rather than the body that leads to the soul. And he believed that even though we see imperfections in this world, that there is a world that is completely perfect. He called the world of ideas where everything originates from. So a bit like how you may have a, a mold where you will build, say, um, gingerbread men. And you may then have, your, your mold is perfect, but it may be that your gingerbread um, biscuits may crack, may, you may lose the head, the arm, because of some consequence, and therefore it's imperfect. But that orig original idea is perfect and has and is, uh, is always been there, it's eternal. Aristotle, who was a student of Plato, originally followed Plato, but then began to disagree with him. And so he had a completely different idea. His view essentially was that the psyche or the soul is really um, a function of the body. It is produced from the body, and therefore when the body dies, by and large, your soul or your psyche essentially dies as well. So for him, if you think about, if you take an animal's eye, he says this in one of his books, if you think of an eye, for the eye, the soul for the body is what vision or sight is for an eye. It's basically the function of all those cells that come together that lead to, for example, sight or hearing. So the soul is essentially a vital essence that comes about through the processes, the physical processes in the body. Now, throughout time, many people have come to support one or either of these opinions, and in many cases they've combined some of these opinions, but you can see this route from there on until the present time. So, for example, some of the more famous people who've supported Plato's ideas are Plotinus, um, who believed, again, in the concept that he called the One. He believed in an eternal being from which all other beings uh, come about. So every soul comes about through this eternal one, with a capital O, being. And in more recent times, um, in, or at least the beginning of the Christian development of the Christian ideas of philosophy, um, St. Augustine also very much followed Plato's views. And then what became interesting as time goes along, so we're now coming up to about from 9 o'clock last night to 1 o'clock today, that um, in the East, Islam came about. And the original, the early caliphs or the rulers of the Islamic kingdom became very interested in Greeks and Greek philosophy because they thought that they had some secrets for their health. And so they commissioned all the works of the great philosophers to be translated into Arabic. And from there arose a whole movement into studying um, uh, essentially Greek, classical Greek philosophy and the ideas of the self and the mind, but also relating it to their own faith, as had also started with the Christian West. And interestingly, a lot of those works later became translated, translated into Latin through people like Avicenna or Averroes, and they then began to influence Western philosophers um, around um, sort of around the 1100s, 1200s, around that time. And so, again, we see that these movement of these classical Greek philosophers continue through both East